is this era of Chinese restaurants, family Chinese restaurants, is that going to continue, you think, or is it changing, or is it going to stay the same? Well, I, it is changed. I mean, everything's in flux. Um, like, uh, this is true, like, like Chinese laundries, for example. Chinese laundries hit the wall when the uh, washing machines came out. So they started becoming more focused on dry cleaning. Now, those people that, like, you know, their children have grown up and gotten degrees and left, and now some of the uh, Koreans are entering that field. So the, there'll be a new wave of immigrants coming in. So, like, some of the Vietnamese, especially um, those of Chinese ancestry, ethnic Chinese, and some of them, especially if they don't, I mean, if they don't have any education or, or resources, they'll come in to the like um, areas that are sort of low rent, whatever, and they'll open a family business of some sort, whether it's a, a restaurant or not, I can't absolutely say. So there'll always be some, but it won't be maybe the same dishes and the same cuisine. There'll be some, some variants of it. But yeah, I think it's just important to understand that uh, all these immigrants groups, they, they, they get in on the bottom ladder and they kind of scratch their way up, you know, so we but sure they, they, it calls for a lot of persistence and determination and, you know, stick to it. And, and I think that's probably why I'm kind of fascinated with you know, all these different things from, from the Chinese population to sort of understand that myself. You know. And I'm sure this is true for other groups as well, but I'm just speaking for the Chinese immigrants. Now, with the Chinese immigrants, you know, it's hard to talk um, as if they're a real homogeneous group. I mean, Chinese have gotten much more diverse now because um, many more in the last decade or so have come over with resources. You know, some of the ones from Taiwan and Hong Kong came over with a lot of money. Not true in, in education. You know, the, and, and even knew how to speak English. Well, that wasn't true of the Chinese who came at the you know late 1800s, early 1900s. And so, um, what what then happens will be different. And so, like sometimes when I, I give a talk, I occasionally find some Chinese person who's not related to the Guangdong ancestry, and they'll say, "Oh, well, that's very interesting," but they don't say it quite this many words. But I know what they're saying. How is this relevant to me? <laughs> You know, I, you know, my father, you know, is a millionaire in Taiwan, and he, you know, has a company and this, that, and the other, and, you know. Okay, so I say to him, well, as far as I know, you look Chinese to me. <laughs> <laughs> I say, as far, as far as people are not Chinese, I don't care whether you've got a million dollars, or whether you just got the boat, or whether you're from Taiwan, or whether you're second generation, third generation, whatever. You walk down the street, and people first look at you, first thing they see is, you're Chinese. And this, this history of how Chinese were perceived and treated over the last century, there's still remnants of that that are going to influence how even the most privileged you know, Chinese in terms of education and, and resources, I'm still going to be part of them that's going to be considered Chinese. And the old joke is, you know, the guy's got a, Chinese guy's got a PhD from Harvard, and he's talking to someone. Hi. You should speak good English, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's still there. I, mean, I get a lot of Yeah. Um, I, this may pertain to somewhat your own experience and a lot of the the people that you've spoken to in in a variety of your books. But you know, growing up in America, I I've always been amazed at where you find an isolated Chinese family. With a, I mean, I've eaten Chinese food in Tonopah, Nevada. You know what I mean? Like oh, yeah, they're yeah. and I and I'm interested in if, in talking to these people. Is there sort of a common? It seems like it's a it's a very courageous strategy to sort of strike out and move into places where you aren't sure what you're going to mm -hmm. encounter. So I was wondering if there there may be themes or ways that people have talked about this choice yeah. to well, move to these areas. No, that's a good question, but it's not necessarily a choice. Sometimes it's, you have to have a choice. Mm -hmm. See, like, I don't know if you're familiar with the book uh, that came out a year or so ago by Gene Faiser called Driven Out, which is a really detailed story about how on the West Coast in particular, the Chinese will literally run out of town on the rails. You know, you get until midnight to get out of Tacoma. Mm -hmm. Right. They call right. it the Tacoma oh. method. You know, and you, you're going to die if you don't get out of here. Okay, so you bamboo. And you start moving east. And so they ended up going to places where the, 
it was, you know, the old saying, safety in numbers? Right. Not safety in numbers. Safety is being by yourself because you're no longer a threat or less of a threat. Uh, and so you kind of like aren't noticed as much. But once you get out there and you've got like several hundred of you and you're all kind of clammed together, you know, grouped together, then, you know, people might get a little suspicious of you and they kind of worry about you. But like my family, we were the only ones in our town. I mean, we weren't a threat to anyone. So they left us alone, right? So um, Topa, uh, wherever it was, in the bottom of the that, Yeah, that's probably like on the, <laughs> on the main line of the Pacific. If you look along where it goes, like Omaha, Provo, Ogden, probably within a few miles of there, you're going to find Chinese all along the rail line. You know? mm -hmm. Because when, see, when the railroad was finished in 1869, there was a gigantic celebration, hurrah, the transcontinental. Mm -hmm. The Chinese, it was, hey, we're unemployed. <laughs> we haven't done any work. <laughs> so, and they didn't even get return fare back to the West Coast. And I was like, hey, you're, you're here. Where, <laughs> you're here pro in, in um, Promontory Point, Utah, or whatever. And so they gravitate to where they go. But um, this, the network is really important. See, I'm doing some research now because I'm following up on my Mississippi Chinese stuff. And it's amazing how complicated their migration patterns are. Um, it's not uncommon for many of them to go on to live in five or six different places before they ended up where they met. It's like they didn't just come over to San Francisco, get off the boat, and go straight to Mississippi. Yeah. You know, they went to Portland, they went to Fargo, they went to Minneapolis, they went to Chicago, and then maybe they had a relative who said, "Hey, um, there's economic opportunity here," and then they go down there. And yeah, it's fascinating. Why? Why were the Chinese? considered a threat because if you think in terms of the Mormons who were a threat because economically they were you know did very well but the Chinese that, that came over for the building were uh, mainly rural people so mm -hmm. why were well they because it was cheap labor see um, Chinese would would always work for the lowest price and they worked hard and so um, when there was economic prosperity it wasn't a problem you know there's lots of everybody but uh, around the 1870s, in particular, there was a big major depression, which lasted probably, you know, for 20 years or something. And so uh, AFL-CIO, in particular, Samuel Gompas, was one of the most racist, you know. He, it was because of his protectionism. We want the jobs for white people. So the Chinese people, yeah, they're peasants, but we don't want them here. And we don't want any more coming. So we want to get rid of the ones that are here, and we don't want to let any more come in. <coughs> this was true in Canada, too. And, Chinese had that same experience in Australia, New Zealand. You know, it's not just unique to the United States. Because um, Chinese were different, um, and they were um, cheap labor, and, you know, other kinds of concerns about, the, you know, being different. They don't want them there after they've done the work. So, like, okay, you finish the railroad, now, now go home. Yes, anything else? Any more questions? On a different note, um, what trend do you see for the next hot Chinese cuisine? <laughs> hot chicken. Hot chicken. Sweet and sour. Sweet and sour. Sweet and sour always seems to be popular, right? But these days, you know, you hardly find chop suey anymore. Is it kind of like faded away the last 20 years? What do you think the reason of that? Well, there's better stuff to eat. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the main reason. Um, I thought we don't want to disparage chop suey entirely. I mean, there's probably some good chop suey and some bad chop suey. So, see, chop suey was popular um, because for one thing, if you did it right, you had, like, you had the right ingredients, and you had fresh ingredients, Chinese food, especially at the stir fry, was popular because um, it was quick, it was tasty, it was cheap. You know, but you had to have fr <coughs> fresh ingredients. You can't have like canned stuff, and right. So, one of the big issues, you know, when they were accusing the Chinese of all these various <laughs> things, they said, Chicago newspaper actually had an article. They said, we went and asked all these people for a recipe, and they said, we tried it. We asked Chinese people to recipe for chop suey, but we tried to cook it and it wouldn't work. The Chinese are holding out some secret ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> That's how suspicious it works. And, you know, part of 
was bean sprouts. You know, because you, 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 can't, you can't have those sitting around for weeks and weeks. You know, you got to get them fresh, fresh vegetables. I remember reading a story about some guy in New York City started growing bean sprouts. <laughs> And then he would drive them all the way as far as Ohio because he had Chinese restaurant customers mm. who would buy his bean sprouts. So can you imagine getting in his car and driving a little car load of bean sprouts and dropping them all along the way to Ohio? I mean, that's how important it was for them to have fresh ingredients that they were willing to pay for that. Mm. 